going to start by just posing a couple of pairs of moral dilemmas. These are very famous moral dilemmas that psych first philosophers and now psychologists, are, and neur even neuroscientists, are trying to figure out how to, how to answer. So here's the first pair. This pair is called the trolley problem. So the trolley problem starts like this. Bob is a train conductor, and he's driving his train down the tracks one day. And as he's driving down the tracks, he sees that on the track ahead of him is a man who's stuck in the tracks. And if Bob doesn't do anything, then his train will run over this man and kill him. Sorry, right. right. There's five men. Yeah. I'm getting this wrong. There's five men stuck in the track in front of him. And if Bob doesn't do anything, his train will run over all five of them. But Bob has an alternative. He can pull a lever in the train, which will move it onto a sidetrack. And if he moves the train onto the sidetrack, there's one man in the sidetrack, and he'll kill one man instead of killing the five men. So the question is, how many people in the room think that it would be acceptable, it would be morally permissible for Bob to pull the lever and turn the train and kill one man but save the five lives? Is it OK? What do you think? Like most people think that's okay. Okay, here's an example that goes kind of like that. There are five patients in the hospital who are dying from organ failure. And Sarah's a doctor, she's a surgeon, and all five of her patients are gonna die. But a perfectly healthy person has just walked into the hospital, and if Sarah kills that person and takes <laughs> all of the organs, Sarah will be able to save all five of her patients. So how many people think it would be acceptable for Sarah <laughs> to kill that person and save the families. <laughs> One person thinks That's it's a moral incredible. philosopher right <laughs> yeah, there. Right. <laughs> <laughs> That's some kind of ethicist. That's the trolley problem. It seems like in both cases, there's five lives on the one hand, one life on the other hand. And yet it makes a difference to us, you know, the, the way in which the scenario plays out, whether we think it's acceptable or unacceptable. Um, and there's a debate about what makes the difference for us. As ph philosophers have wondered whether there should be a difference, neuroscientists wonder why is there a difference? Why does it feel like there's a difference, whether there should be or there shouldn't be? And in those cases, um, the neuroscientists who work on this, my colleagues, for example, Josh Green, have focused on the role of emotion, so the emotional response that you have to the idea. And, and Josh's idea is that, that when you're pulling a lever to switch between these two outcomes, you're much more detached from the killing of the man on the sidetrack, whereas having to actually bodily take the patient and kill them is sort of a much more emotionally arousing outcome. That's a disputed theory of what's going on. But so he, he's been focusing on the role of emotional brain regions in responding to, to these scenarios. But so here's another example, and this one's sort of closer to my, to my own work. So a new story. This story is about a CEO. And the CEO runs a company that needs to build a new factory. And they're choosing between locations for where to build the factory. And a great location has come up next to a lake. It's going to be great for all kinds of reasons. They'll make lots of money, and their product will be very efficient, and transportation will be easy. But just before he makes the decision, somebody comes to the CEO and says, you know, our research suggests that if we build this factory right here by the lake, it will harm the environment. And the CEO says, I don't care about harming the environment. All I want to do is make as much money as possible. Go ahead and build the factory. So they build the factory, and sure enough, the environment is harmed. So how many people here think that he harmed the environment intentionally? About half. OK, now I'm going to tell you a new story. There's a CEO of a company, and he's deciding to build a factory somewhere for his company. And then a location comes up by a lake. It's a great location. It'll be great for finances and great for transport. But the problem, that just before he's going to make this decision, somebody runs in and says to the CEO, you know, if we build this factory right here by the lake, it will help the environment. And the CEO says, I don't care about helping the environment. I just want to make as much money as possible. <laughs> so they build the factory, and sure enough, the environment is helped. So how many people think he helped the environment intentionally? <laughs> Not even the two guys. Yeah. So at least in this case, it seems like what we're seeing is the interface between morality and perception of intentionality. And not only that, but this interface seems to be going in the wrong direction. So we'd all accept that you try to figure out what somebody intended before you decide how much to blame them. But this seems like we're deciding how much we want to blame them before we decide how much they intended it. And that seems like a puzzle. Hmm. So the work that I've been doing is looking at these brain regions involved and figuring out what other people think and how they're processing these scenarios to try to get a sense of, well, what's going on for us? What rule is our perception of other people's mm. beliefs and intentions 
playing and generating these moral judgments. But I just want to say, you know, one danger of having a bunch of scientists sit in front of a room and talk is we have a tendency to make it sound like we know what's going on. <laughs> and in particular, <laughs> this particularly struck me with this example with the decision making where you can measure the individual neurons. And fMRI is great, but it's nothing like being able to measure the individual neurons. Not only can we not measure the individual neurons, but I think we as scientists, maybe we as people, can't even imagine what it would look like for a neuron to be representing the, the CEO intentionally harm the environment. I mean, I can imagine a neuron that you know, is hooked up to the eyes in the right way that it responds to a vertical line versus a horizontal line. That's thanks to my 15 years of training in this field. I can imagine that neuron. But I think the neuron which knows that somebody intentionally harmed the environment, it's beyond my imagination mm -hmm. even what that neuron looks like. <laughs> and so, so in this topic of trying to figure out how brains represent other minds, you know, we're trying to figure out how a biological computing machine can construct an abstract idea. And I don't think we're anywhere near the answer.